Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the the presentation of the book. I, I, yeah, I'm I'm so happy to see you all here and uh, to see uh, people from different parts of of my life in the states. Uh, people from Christ the King, people from. Um, Community liberation. A few people are coming here to the shrine. It's great to see you all. And um, it is the uh, the first time that I'm doing uh, this this job of uh, the book launch. Yeah, I have I have to to confess I'm a bit nervous. I don't know why. But um, yeah, that is I think the best thing to start is to say a prayer. It is. Um, Say the prayer that uh, remember us the moment when the Word became flesh and dwells among us, the, the angels. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. The angel of the Lord declaring to Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is it thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Pray for us, uh, and the word was made flesh. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Let us pray. Put forth, you beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ, thy Son, was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection. To the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So on July 2nd, 95, I, I was ordained priest in Lisbon, Portugal. And I was a parochial vicar for two years. And then I was pastor for 13 years in the, in the Diocese of Lisbon. In 2010, my superiors of the Fraternity of St. Charles sent me to the United States. I was a pastor of Christ the King Parish in Silver Spring, Maryland, for five years. I had some troubles getting the visa, taking much more time than expected. I, I should have done some training for six months in an American parish before becoming a pastor in order to improve my English and to adapt to the culture. That never happened. And uh, a few days after my ar arrival to the States, I was installed as pastor at Christ the King. Poor parishioners of Christ the King. <laughs> so after my, my first Mass, the, my first daily Mass, a kind couple approached me in the sacristy to welcome me to the parish. And they told me that they, they could help me to improve my English. And then I understood that they had a hard time understanding my sermon. <laughs> so I accepted the offering, and uh, since then I've been working with Peggy and Miro Vuko almost every week. She's been my editor all these years, um, more than 10 years. Without uh, the, their generous and tireless help, it would be impossible to publish this book. I am eternally grateful for their help and friendship. It has been crucial for the carrying out of my ministry of the word. Some people have been asking me, uh, why are you publishing a book? And the book of sermons? Well, um, my only answer can be to evangelize. Uh, it comes 
to my mind the words of St. Paul, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. I do believe that preaching is an essential part of the priestly ministry. Uh, somehow, what I wrote represents what has been my mission in the United States. It tells what I believe and what I care the most about in my ministry. It is the word of God that builds up the church. We only evangelize if we proclaim Jesus Christ. As St. Paul said, for we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for the sake of Jesus. I hope that uh, the reading of these sermons might help those who will read them to grow in the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ. I would like to briefly comment about the, the title of the book, The Sower Went Out to Sow, Short Parochial Sermons. I have uh, to confess that I have uh, plagiarized the title. <laughs> That's what's bad. And I, I did it not just from one author, but two authors. St. <laughs> Anthony of Padua and St. John Henry Newman. St. Anthony of Padua, doctor of the church, and the only thing that he wrote was a book of sermons. His home city was the same of mine, Lisbon. He joined the Franciscans uh, before he was an Augustin, Augustinian friar and left his country in the maturity of his life to be a missionary in the world. St. John Henry Newman, a theologian and a preacher, in my modest opinion, the best part of his work are his sermons, or at least the best uh, part to be read. His, his sermons were published with uh, the title Parochial and Plain Sermons. Mine are short. Because I am short in the presence of such, such a giant uh, theologian, scholar, poet, and saint. And also because uh, the length of my sermons are much brief than his. Nevertheless, the comparison with the great doctors help us to grow at least a few inches in wisdom. In the, the sermon of uh, Sexagesima, entitled The Sower Went Out to Sow, St. Anthony wrote, and I quote, the seed, as our Lord himself explains in today's gospel, is the word of God. I pray that I myself may be found worthy to share in the blessedness of the blessed. That is why I wish to cast seed upon you in the name of Jesus Christ. He went forth from the bosom of the Father and enter the world to sow his seed. The sower stands both for Christ and for whoever preaches Christ." End quote. I would like to thank uh, my former parishioners from Christ the King, Christine Tan and Katie Holland for their generous support of the book. A very special thanks to Amanda Martin for her dedicated and competent work and precious, pre precious suggestions. Without her help, this book would have never seen the light of day. I would like uh, to thank um, the director of the shrines, Maxime Logier, for his support for this initiative and also for hosting uh, this event, as well all the members of the staff that uh, uh, helped and to organize this presentation. I'm very grateful to Dr. John McCarthy to be with us today. Um, as you know, Dr. McCarthy is the dean of the dean of the CUA School of Philosophy and uh, an old friend of mine. Today is going to help us in the dialogue about the book. A very special thanks to Sister Anna Ray for accepting to present the book. 
Sister Anna Roy is a Dominican sister of St. Cecilia and a adjunct assistant professor at COA School of Philosophy. She's also a great speaker, and she's able to speak about the most abstract themes in a humorous way. In, in her, we can see that faith and reason go together in a fascinating way. Please, Sister Anna. You might be shorter than uh, John Henry Newman, but I'm shorter than you. <laughs> One of the few hopeful remarks that's attributed to Friedrich Nietzsche is the observation that man can endure any how as long as he has a why. There are two whys to my presentation, and I'd like to try to endear those whys to you now, just in case the how of my speaking becomes something that you have to endure rather than enjoy. The first why I have in mind is to convince you to read Father's book. Note that my goal is not to convince you simply to purchase the book, but to read it. When I was young, one of my favorite bedtime stories was about a man who wanted to become a doctor. The man's wise or not so wise friend advised him to acquire and then to carry around a top hat, a black bag, and a large ABC book. If someone happened to approach the man with a question, the friend continued, the man should open the ABC book and leaf through it slowly, looking for the picture of the rooster. I mention this story without spoiling how things turn out for the so-called doctor, because it illustrates precisely what I advise you not to do with father's book. The book will do you no good if it remains on the shelf or if you carry it around and occasionally look inside for a picture of the rooster. Bring the book home because you intend to read it, not because you like the idea of having the book. I hope that my subsequent remarks will help to strengthen that intention. The second why, that is the second reason I have for giving this presentation is to trick you into joining the conversation that began more than two decades ago when Father asked me, not two decades ago, <laughs> a decade ago, uh, when Father asked the Holy Spirit what to say to his flock at Christ the King. The simple profundity of Father's sermons is evident enough that the Holy Spirit answered Father's questions. And it's evidence too that Father obediently spoke aloud the words that he heard spoken in his heart. The words that I will offer today about Father's words are unfortunately neither simple nor profound. They are nonetheless the only words that I have. The most that I can do, and the only thing I hope to do, is to offer my words with honesty, humility, and courage. In spite of my best efforts though, I'm bound to say at least a few things that are incomplete, inaccurate, incomprehensible, inaudible, inane, or any other adjective beginning with I-N. <laughs> Although initially it will fall to John McCarthy to draw your attention and mine to the inadequacy of my words, even he, in spite of his best efforts, won't eliminate the inadequacies of my words, and he might even add to them. This is where the explicit audience participation begins. Whether you endure or enjoy the remainder of my remarks and the subsequent exchange with John McCarthy and Father, please know that your own honest, humble, and courageous comments and questions will be most welcome. These then are the two whys or ends of my presentation, to convince you to read the book and to join the conversation. I only have one how, that is one means by which I'll attempt to convince you. I'd like to describe three faults of which I was convicted as I read Father's sermons. Although ordinarily I would hesitate to declare my faults aloud to an auditorium filled with friendly strangers, it's much easier to do this since I'm convinced that my three faults are also your three faults. <laughs> 
We find it easier to admit to our neighbor that we've drunk directly from the milk carton if we catch that neighbor in the same act, milk mustache and all. All this is to say, the faults of which I was convicted as I made my way through Father's sermons appear to me to be the same faults to which every fallen and redeemed child of God is prone. As I read, I became aware that Father Zay, or rather God the Father through Father Zay, was addressing me, not in my strength, but precisely in my greatest and your greatest weakness. First, in my tendency to relate to others through the head, to the exclusion of relating from the heart. Second, in my tendency to attend first to my initiative as opposed to the initiative of God. And third, in my tendency to prefer remaining busy even when I'm aware of being invited to rest. Of course, in themselves, there's nothing crippling about thinking, taking initiative, or being busy. It's only when these activities become primary or absolute for us that they begin to wound us deeply. In order to prevent you from being further wounded by any lack of order in my words, here's a roadmap for my subsequent remarks. And I apologize beforehand for foisting upon you my love of counting to two and three. For each of the three faults, intellectualism, Pelagianism, and activism, or IPA, for those of you who like acronyms, I'll draw from Father's sermons to describe two things. First, what is it like to live with this fault? And second, what is the remedy for those of us who suffer from this fault? Before turning to the first fault, I'll say two words about the relationship between Father Zay's words and mine. And then I promise that I'll give you a break from counting to two and three. First, I'll do what can't be done in academia, but what is always done among friends. I'll take Father's words as my own, implicitly giving him credit for saying and believing before me and with me everything that I recognize to be true. Second, I'll also do something that is frequently done in academia and that I wish I could avoid doing now among friends. I'll say in a more complicated and formulaic manner what Father originally said with great simplicity and natural integrity. If you prefer the original, and I hope you do, read the book. The first fault, intellectualism. What is it like to relate to others through the head to the exclusion of relating from the heart. It's like someone who is so afraid of being overwhelmed by light that he puts on very dark sunglasses with thick frames. He eats, he sleeps, and even showers with the glasses on and takes comfort knowing that anything that hits his eyes will be dark and manageable and it will fit inside the frames. This is to say, to relate to others through the head means to care so much about my theories, my plans, and my ideas that I cannot or will not encounter reality without them. I look at myself, at others, and even at God through the glasses of my own judgments. This doesn't mean that all judgments blind us. There's a difference between arriving at a judgment because I've encountered something beautiful and clinging to a judgment because I'm afraid of what I might encounter. In other words, relating to others through the head is not simply a matter of making judgments, but of making control a way of life. I control my fear by drawing boundaries around what I'm willing to suffer. Anything that falls outside those boundaries, outside the frames of my glasses, is only a concept for me. In fact, anything that comes to me through these glasses is only a concept because I relate not to the thing itself, which is colorful and bright and dangerous, but only to an abstraction of that thing, the abstraction that I'm willing to tolerate. Needless to say, God does not come to us as an abstraction. He doesn't invite us to encounter him as a distant spectacle, 
but rather as one who has a heart, who wishes to be in our hearts, and who mysteriously wishes for us to be in his heart. How can this happen? How can we be delivered from living in our heads? How can we release our grip on our own judgments and open our hands and our hearts so that we can encounter, enjoy, and suffer what wondrously and gloriously is? How can we begin to live, to receive ourselves, others, and God in our hearts? Come to me, all you who are weary and are burdened. Jesus Christ is the way that leads from the head to the heart. Jesus is present at every point along the way, from the deepest places of our desperation to the heights of full surrender. Jesus is present in the most fearful place in your heart. What is he doing there? He's calling you to encounter him right there in your heart. He calls you by posing questions questions that you could try to answer for yourself, but that ultimately can only be answered by him, not by his words, but by his being with you. If we wish to be drawn from our heads to our hearts, what must we do? We must listen. Listen for the voice of Jesus, who calls to us from our heart to remain in our heart with him. To listen, we must long to hear. We must make this longing to hear and remain with Jesus the anchor of our lives. The second fault, Pelagianism. When I was very young, I remember playing with the slugs that used to slime their way across my grandparents' driveway in Southern California. I noticed that whenever I would poke a slug with my finger, it would curl up into a little slug ball. I concluded after many experiments that turning inward was the only thing that the slugs knew how to do in the face of an attacking finger. This seemed to me to be a very sorry existence. The slugs' only defense was obviously inadequate, and they didn't seem willing to admit it or to seek out any other options. Being a Pelagian is something like being one of those little slugs. A Pelagian is one who longs to be loved by God, but who responds to this longing, this poking, by turning his gaze and his attention backward in on himself. Like the slug, the Pelagian repeatedly assumes the posture of self-word gaze. When he first looks upon himself, what he sees are his faults. Those things he believes make him less lovable in God's eyes. Because he wishes to become lovable in God's eyes, and because he believes that he can make himself lovable, the Pelagian turns his gaze upon himself again. This time, in order to see what he can do to eliminate his faults. After he attempts to remove his faults, he looks to himself yet again as the measure of his effort's success. If we find ourselves in this posture, if we repeatedly turn to ourselves in order to make ourselves lovable, what can we do? What can we do to finally direct our gaze away from ourselves? Here's the good news. On our own, we can do nothing. That's one half, the half that doesn't yet sound very good. Here's the good half. If we are baptized, we are not on our own. Jesus, whose gaze is forever fixed upon the face of the Father, is in us. Jesus, present in our hearts, desires to return all that we have and are to the Father. All we have to do is let him. If you don't resist, you will find yourself looking upon the Father looking upon you. And you will know in that gaze your true identity. Not what you are in your own eyes, but what you are in his. And the Father has already told us what he sees when he looks upon us. 
You are my beloved child. You are mine. The final fault, activism. What is it like to suffer from the tendency to activism? Although almost every moral fault might be described as an addiction, that is, as a progressive narrowing of the activities that bring us delight, activism in particular is experienced in this way. We become activists not simply by being active, but by delighting in and preferring the activity that ought to bring us to God more than the activity of being with God. Perhaps we take delight in hearing beautiful music, in reading thoughtful sermons, in rising early before the armies of inconveniences and distractions rush upon us. Listening to music, reading sermons, and rising early are all activities that can lead us to God, but they are also activities that we can target for their own sake, for the sake of experiencing again the pleasure that they've brought us in the past. If we do this, if we target an activity because we wish to experience again a pleasure of the past, we embark upon a chase that we're certain to lose and that we'll find increasingly difficult to quit. Not only will the pleasure of the targeted activities escape us, we'll just have to work harder simply to touch what we previously grasped, but we'll also find ourselves losing sight of the far greater delight of experiencing these pleasures with God and as given to us by God. You would think that once we realize this futile dynamic, we would quit the chase and wait for God to pick us up and carry us home. But activism is perplexing. It's a continued preference for what we know exhausts and fails to satisfy. It's a preference for remaining busy, even when we're aware that we could rest in being carried. And even when, on some level, we long for this rest. How does this perplexing situation come about? Perhaps because we prefer the familiar pain of the chase to the unfamiliar pain of sitting down and waiting for God to meet us in our pain. Or perhaps because we lose sight of the fact that God is already with us, even on our way to him. Jesus in me is always already experiencing what I experience, both the pain of the chase and the desire for ultimate rest. We have already received all that we need. It's in this realization that God dwells in us that we have the resolution to our activism. It's simple, even if it's not easy. Stop running. Sit down and allow yourself, with Jesus in you, to cry out to the Father. Tell the Father that you need to be carried. Tell him that you hurt. Tell him that you don't want to chase pleasures anymore. Tell him that you wish he would take away your pain, but that even if he doesn't, you want him to be with you in your pain. And if you can't find the words or the strength to speak to the Father in this way, good. Allow Jesus to enter into the deepest recesses of your heart and to cry out to the Father for you from there. This alone is rest. This alone is the activity that is never busyness. This is what it is to be with God. Allow Jesus to enter into your drama so that you might enter into his. Allow the outpouring of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to take place within you. At the beginning of my presentation, many minutes ago, and many counts of two and three ago, I announced that I had two goals, to get you to read Father's book and to trick you into joining the conversation that the Holy Spirit initiated with Father. By way of conclusion, I'd like to do two final things that I hope will facilitate a conversation in a practical manner. A note that the two and three counts are returning. First, I'd like to offer three questions that I believe need to be re-asked 
and re-answered as often as any of us here has the honesty, humility, and courage to do so. Here they are. First, what does it mean to live in the heart? Second, what does it mean to surrender? Third, what does it mean to love the Father? The second thing I'd like to do, and final, is to point to two models to whom we can look if we wish to ask and answer these three questions in a manner that both unifies and frees us. The first model is Father Zay. As often as I've spoken with Father or read his sermons, I've had the distinct experience of having my own heart exposed. Exposed not to cold or blinding criticism, but to the illuminating fire of the heart of Christ. The only explanation I have for this is that Father speaks and listens from his heart, and that for him, to live is to expose his heart to the heart of Christ. The second model is Mary. Even more than Father Zay, Mary lived with an open heart. Even before the heart of her son was being formed in her womb, Mary's heart was open to the heart of the Father. Her openness manifested itself as a continual listening for the Father's voice, as an unconditional receptivity to his word. When Mary heard the Father's voice, she responded with a humble, courageous, and infinitely fruitful word of her own, fiat. And may we do the same. Well, sister invited me to correct her, and so I begin with that. Uh, she insisted that there were any number of ins that could be uh, attributed to her remarks. She was not, however, inept or inopportune, indelicate or indecent. Nice try, sister. I also want to thank her, especially for the image of Pelagian slug balls. I, I can see a child's toy, uh, really, or uh, a candy. I think we could really take this to town and make something of it. So thank you, unless you already have it copyrighted. Just think of it. All right. Well, according to Sacrosanctum Concilium, Vatican II's Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy, this is what we think, should think of uh, when we think of a homily. By means of the homily, the mysteries of the faith and the guiding principles of the Christian life are expounded from the sacred text during the course of the liturgical year. The homily, therefore, is to be highly esteemed as part of the liturgy itself. A friend of mine once told me that Mother Teresa took this principle so much to heart that she thought we should listen to the priest's homily with all the attention we would give if Jesus himself were preaching. When I heard that, my first reaction was, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I mean, by that point in my life, and not infrequently, subsequently, I'd heard a fair few homilies that were awful. And in fact, precious few of them have ever stuck in my memory. <laughs> so there was my first thought. My second reaction was, once again, the reaction that I had, or 
perhaps you've had it too when you've uh, heard uh, things um, attributed to Mother Teresa, namely that she'd succeeded once again in uh, making me realize what a lousy Christian I am. My third reaction was, yeah, but what about the lousy homilies? Right. Um, well, here I want to come to Father Zay's book. <laughs> but first, uh, a remark he once made that stuck with me and, uh, in fact, hit me in the, uh, forcefully the very first time I heard it. And it was a remark he made about preaching. I can't remember the occasion, but he said, and I'm not sure of the exact figures he used, if it's three minutes, it's Jesus. If it's five minutes, it's me. If it's seven minutes, it's the devil. <laughs> Here then is one great thing that recommends his homilies. They're short. That is, there's maybe, <laughs> we ha we'd have to test this, right? We'd have to read them all and see how long they took. How much of the devil is in there? Um, <laughs> not much, I'd say. And not much of him. But enough of him, I think, to uh, make the point. Let me mention right away then a second consideration that he had adverted to in his opening remarks today and in his introduction. Uh, but first, a bit of context. Uh, and that only for those here who have never found themselves in a foreign land trying to express themselves in a language that's not native to them. Um, I've had the joy of such an experience myself on a few occasions. And uh, if you haven't, uh, your life is uh, less rich for it because you feel like a child. You feel totally inadequate. Um, it's a real suffering to try to, s to speak your thoughts, to express yourself in a language not your own. Um, and, and in fact, early on, I heard from Father Zay, he told this uh, to me about, uh, and others about these parishioner friends, if they're here today, I'd love to meet them, who uh, wanted to help him um, communicate his mind in, in English. Um, when you're trying to speak in a language not your own, you really do feel like a child at the beginning. Um, and there's something childlike still, even in uh, Father Zay's uh, written words, um, in a way that's purified of the grammatical inadequacies and that I hope he never loses. All right. Um, why do these homilies recommend themselves? Um, let me return to the devil. This is from a homily on September 14th, 2014 the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. Um, and a uh, number of his homilies are, um, have as their theme, humility. Here now he warns uh, uh, about a danger. Even in religious things, we can be searching for our own glory, trying to find recognition from man. When we exalt ourselves, the cross of our lives becomes insupportable. And then later on, he expands really on this point and speaks much more directly about the danger. Uh, this is the 31st Sunday in Ordinary Time back in 2011. He's speaking about priests. Or rather, he adverts to uh, the way the scriptures of the day speak about priests, beginning with uh, Malachi. And then he says, there is the risk of our becoming managers of an organization and preachers of ourselves. There is the risk of clericalism, of understanding our priesthood as a task 
and not as belonging to Christ. Instead of being men of God, we can be employees of religion. And then this, here is this, the, uh, you can hear him saying this in the next sentence. This is very sad, he says. <laughs> and then towards the end of that same homily, he quotes from Father Luigi Giussani, um, the priest who inspired the founding of his religious community. Quote, to be good priests, you first of all have to be men, to feel what men feel. Live the truth of your humanity. Cry because you need to cry, or you are afraid because the problem is difficult and you feel the inadequacy of your strength. Be human. So there's the first thing. Um, Father Zay in his homilies is uh, aware of the danger uh, that must attend, haunt every homilizer. Uh, the second thing that comes out very forcefully in these homilies um, is the love he has for his priesthood. So the very first homily, the 21st Sunday in Ordinary Time back in 2010, August 22nd, I want to thank you for the way I was received into the parish last week, exclamation point. There are lots of exclamation marks in the, these homilies. Again, I, I can hear him speaking even though I wasn't there for that homily. Um, he means it. He's grateful to be in front of uh, those he uh, preaches to. Or again, on Pentecost Sunday in 2014, eight years after um, his confirmation, which occurred on a Pentecost Sunday in 1987, he says, eight years later, I was ordained a priest. This was the beginning of the journey that brought me here. When I was 16, I never would have thought that someday I would be a pastor in Washington, D.C. It is unimaginable where the Holy Spirit can lead us. So uh, here's a man who loves his priesthood, astonished by it, maybe. Another thing that recommends these homilies, his sense that he belongs to something much bigger than himself. on the 30th Sunday in Ordinary Time in 2010. He begins, this week I received a letter from the poor Clares of Perpetual or Adoration. And then he quotes from the letter, and then he writes, or speaks, and then writes, this letter reminds me how important prayer is for the accomplishment of a mission. Knowing that I have a contemplative community praying for me is a great support for what I have to do. I feel accompanied. Or later, the 23rd Sunday in Ordinary Time, September 2014. In my life, I am very grateful to the people who have corrected me I'm thinking of my parents, educators, superiors, brothers, priests, friends, parishioners, and so forth. Of course, we do not like being corrected, but afterwards, we understand that it is for our own good. He belongs to something more, and that uh, is resonant in more than himself, and resonant in all these homilies. Finally, his homilies are marked above all, um, I think, by his dedication uh, not to talking at us, not to trying to persuade us of anything. There are no rhetorical flourishes here, no long wind-ups, no starting with a joke that uh, right <laughs> tries to win us over. Um, lower our resistance so that he can go in for the sale. <laughs> not uh, talking at us, and not even in the first 
instance talking to us, or even in the first instance talking with us. Uh, but somehow, rather, um, I think they're marked by hmm, his, by something Sister adverts to and spoke about very nicely, that, uh, that he makes space in himself so that Christ can speak to him such that uh, when he speaks, he's really looking over his shoulder, as it were, or, or adverting to something, someone that he's seen uh, that, that has spoken to him and that he really only um, seeks to witness to. So, the 23rd Sunday in Ordinary Time, September 5, 2010. He begins that day. Prefer nothing whatever to Christ. Today, I want to meditate with you upon this quotation from St. Benedict. It will help us to understand our disturbing gospel reading, which was Luke 14 that day. This qu quotation is very important for me. Before my ordination, I made a retreat at a Benedictine monastery. When I entered, the first thing I saw was that quotation written on a wall. It became very important to me then and in all the days of my life. Or even once or twice in the homilies, he refers to other homilies such that he does the very thing uh, that uh, uh, Mother Teresa urged him to do and that I have so often failed to do. He mentions on the solemnity of the epiphany of the Lord. I had the grace to be at the closing of the holy door presided over by John Paul II on January 6, 2001. I still remember the Pope's homily, particularly the following passage, which he then quotes, and I'll let you read for yourselves when you buy the book, as of course you will. And then earlier, or later, earlier in the book, later in his life, he quotes the following at the beginning of his homily that day, 26th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Where God is, there is a future. This week I was struck by a statement Pope Benedict made during his trip to Germany, where God is, there is a future. I can see a link between what the Pope said and today's gospel. Jesus says that we need to change our minds to enter the kingdom of God. So, with this, I conclude my remarks and um, invite your remarks. Um, I, I've understood reading or dipping into, since I haven't read them all the way through or meditate, read them meditatively enough to, um, to be adequate to them, I've understood a little better how um, a good homily is, uh, is a guide to how I ought to speak and, and walk and, uh, and you ought to speak and walk. And here I'm homilizing. Right. <laughs> you better do it, <laughs> because the world needs it. Uh, we all need it. So for, uh, with that, I'll conclude uh, this part I'm supposed to moderate for some inane reason he thinks I should moderate. Um, to thank Father Zay for, for being Father Zay. I mean f being Zay, but being Father Zay and his homilies uh, and with us. Uh, questions to direct to Father Zay. The microphone. Right uh, there's, there's one. There's one there.
Hi everyone. <laughs> it's not easy to be the first one to take the floor, <laughs> but I'm taking the plunge. In fact, it's a comment for Father's Day. And my comment comes from what I hear today, and what he said, what Sister said, and all what the moderator also said. They all spoke about the same thing, which is being able to speak in a language which is not your la native language, mainly when you are already an adult. It's not easy. It requires a lot of commitment, a lot of brain work, and a lot of humility. Because as you said, sometimes you feel like a child. You know what you want to say. And you have your words in your native language. But you, can't, you have to think deep to be able to express it in English or in another language. It doesn't mean that you are stupid, you are dumb, or you don't know. But it's just that you need to find the right word at the right time to do it. And mainly as a priest, being able to stand in front of an audience and to present an homily, hoping that you are conveying God's message to people in their native language, which is not yours, really, that take a lot of work, a lot of courage, and I want to commend you for that, Father Zé. And Thank you. Not only you did that when you were in Silver Spring, you are doing it every day up to now, and you didn't stop you are taking it to another level. Because not only you are speaking, but now you are an author. You are writing in English. <laughs> and I will just say, you are an inspiration. Thank you for who you are, Father Z. That's my comment. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Father Zé. Uh, I haven't uh, read the book yet, uh, but I saw the book when he was still <laughs> coming <laughs> along. <laughs> I remember, you know, going quickly to, uh, uh, through some of the, some of the homilies. And, uh, and I have heard many of your homilies, so uh, during all these years, and uh, my question is very simple, is a methodological one to you. Uh, you don't, you don't, uh, you couldn't uh, uh, include in the book all your sermons. You had, you had to, you had to separate. You had to prioritize. Uh, you had to take some <laughs> uh, and leave for, you know, for later or, or never. So my question is, uh, when you decided which one you include, uh, what were the, the, the criteria or the, or the principles that uh, you use? Were the ones that uh, you struck you the most, most or, or were something that you want to convey, some message that you want to convey? I mean, how, do you, how, did, you, how did you do it? So I have to confess, because uh, I've been here since 2010. I have a lot of material. I, wor I work with this um, editor every week, almost every week. And um, he's a professional editor. So what I had was more, more or less uh, possible to publish. Then there were no uh, any flaws of grammar or whatever. Even, uh, but, but then, um, yeah, the, um, the selection I have to say I was uh, I had a lot of material and I was a bit blind to see what could be published, and then I asked someone uh, to to take a look, and uh, and and to read the sermons and to and to to see what uh, what could be published or how to publish. 
So and then this this person uh, reading the sermon saw that there were seven themes that I repeat. It was funny, seven themes. The, the, the themes are in the in the book, um, but um, yeah, from uh, I don't know, vocation, mission, uh, uh, humility, um, conversion, justice and mercy, uh, and Mary. And there are someone else. Some other themes I don't remember. <laughs> there are seven, seven. So then, then. Uh, um, so the, they were selected from the, the themes, somehow the best of, <laughs> of those themes, and uh, that was the way. Uh, I have to say that what, what the sister and John said about uh, the book, uh, yeah, they, they see much more than what I can see, and uh, what they said is much even better than what I <laughs> I have written. <laughs> Father Zay, um, two things. One, being a convert to Catholicism and coming from a very evangelical intellectual background, it was one of the most painful discoveries to listen to so many bad Catholic homilies. So I'll never forget the experience of being in your parish, and I've had that experience of struggling with language and just being very moved. Um, by your endurance and persevering to convey that. So even if I didn't understand the words, your very presence and delivery was very powerful and very moving. So I wanna thank you for your courage to do that. And for, um, I see my own pastor, Monsignor Smith is back there. And I have to say, every Sunday I am so grateful when he preaches because I feel like I haven't always had that powerful sermon together with the powerful Eucharist, which are the two beautiful things. But my real question for you um, is about inactivity <laughs> and your time at the monastery because it's the obverse of activism. And I, I, when you made those three points, you drew them out, I, you shared a story, I don't know if people know this, that he spent this time, this very contemplative time and beautiful and peaceful. So I'm wondering if that was also a germination time for you um, in between this period of giving your homilies at uh, at, I can't think of the name of the church, sorry. You know, your, your first section and then this contemplative period and how did that change some of your homilies? Thank you. Um, no, I, I have to say that, um, yeah, it was, it was, I, I spent a, a year or so in the, in the monastery. Well, of course, the, the time spent there to, to prayer, to, to study of the word, uh, it was a Carthusian monastery, so there is a lot of silence there. We always there was in silence, and they have a time really. It was after being at Christ the King. Um, yeah, uh, I've learned a lot uh, there in terms of uh, what does it mean to to listen to the Father's voice and uh, to understand what is Father's voice, is my own voice. <laughs> and uh, But the, the monastic tradition is that the importance that they, they give to liturgy, the study of the Word of God, the Fathers, and that helps to to enter more and more in the, in the Word and the, the understanding of the Scripture. And then uh, I think it's very important then to preach. So when I, when I was there, I was not preaching. In terms of, uh, with I was, uh, I have no saying mass to public, just in the cell. Huh? But somehow I was preaching uh, uh, to the angels, maybe. The angels were, or, or at least take the, the preaching <laughs> to wherever it could be uh, useful, I don't know. In the sense that, the preaching, when you, 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 your heart, you verify with your heart that what uh, Christ answers to your life, to your heart, then you are preaching, even if uh, you di didn't say yet um, a word. So before speaking, or was preaching. Because uh, uh, preaching then is a communication of what yourself... Uh, I, I, um, the three, the three, 
the three points of the sisters uh, said the intellectualism, the, the Pelagianism, and the activism. So uh, things are my, my, my issues. So I'm preaching to myself <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> and it was uh, amazing how you, you found it. <laughs> so I, I never, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, said it, I wrote it in, the, in a clear way. So they were there, in fact, those three things. So, um, yeah. So, well, you, you already said this, I think, a bit, but uh, just to make it more explicit, what what makes a homily a homily? In the sense, uh, what I was thinking now, a hom I, I have in my mind a lot of what is not a homily. Uh, it's not <laughs> a speech, it's not a show, it's not a presentation, it's not a class, it's not exegesis, it's not uh, uh, about morality. It's so I have... Uh, yeah, a lot of not in my mind, but uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, if uh, also after many years of writing and preaching, uh, you can say what's spe specific about what a homily is and uh, what makes a homily a homily and not one of these other things. Because I, I, I just started to write. And I find that is very. It was ordained three months ago. <laughs> I live uh, with the uh, father. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, but I find that uh, it's when you have to write, it's very easy to uh, decide in which of one is not enter. Okay, today is gonna be then I no a show. No, yeah, or yeah. it's gonna be a class, or it's gonna be. Uh, exegesis today, okay, this w Sunday is going to be exegesis, or this, so. I, I think uh, is, for me, is always to ring the, the readings, uh, the, the three readings, and then the, the psalm, and the, also the, all the um, entrance antiphon, um, and the communion antiphon are very, very important um, for me. So, but is is to what does the uh, these uh, words uh, tell me? What the, uh, these readings tell me? First of all, what uh, what call for conversion is here, and then I asked all these people to tell me what the people need uh, to hear. What uh, should I say? What's going on? in the world right now what the people are uh the worries of the people in this moment or what the yeah i think there's a personal level has to be for me uh what uh yeah and then thinking about uh, the audience the and uh it's just not ideas I want to communicate, but uh, somehow it's like this. I think St. John the Baptist is a great um, example of should be uh, a preacher no? because he, he points to Christ. He, 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 so we need to, to find ways to help people, to direct attention of people to Christ himself. No? Um, and and that, in that sense, yeah, we... We use uh, the means that we are able to find to do that somehow. <laughs> I've never preached a homily, uh, but I, I, and I, I'm, I thank God I've never been in that position. Um, uh, but I, it, I w I'd like to suggest something that occurred to me while reading it, um, that, um, and, and f again, to set the stage, one of the things I love about America is YouTube videos <laughs> um, done by people who are trying to explain to others how to fix 
this, that, or the other thing. Um, honest to God, you can get some, there's somebody out there. You've got a plumbing problem, you've got a roofing problem, you've got some problem with a little electrical device. There's somebody out there who's struggled with the same problem, figured out a way to uh, solve it. And most of these people are doing it just out of the love of wanting to communicate what they know. And that's great. Um, but it's never a homily. Um, and I mean, just thinking about Father Zay's situation and then reading these homilies, um, it strikes me that the preacher is never speaking his native language. Um, that, the, that when you're preaching, you're not speaking your language. It's because none of us are experts in, and not the holy ones are even experts in God's language, uh, in the language of his son. So, so, I mean, Mother Teresa could say what she said because she took seriously that the, the, the priest acts in the person, acts in the, in the person of Christ. Right, so uh, that's why it's not crazy for her to say it. Uh, but when when the when the priest is preaching, it seems to me, well, as you've said, uh, you're, you're you're not preaching yourself. You're not preaching your expertise. Uh, somehow or other, you're being spoken to. You're speaking words that are not your own. Uh, there's also another element is that when you are, you are preaching, you are something uh, happens in that moment. The Holy Spirit is working in yourself and the people, and uh, somehow what you have is to, um, yeah, to 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 help people to see uh, God passing. You know? uh, uh, in that moment, the even when I, I usually, at least on Sundays, on Sundays I, I write a homily and I work with my editor. But uh, usually I read it. But sometimes I'm saying a reading, and when I'm reading, I look at the people, and an idea uh, comes and and the changes what I, I, I had to say because no, no, is the is the um, is the gaze, is the uh, the presence of the people, or is. Uh, uh, something is is uh, so uh, somehow we uh, preaching is to help people to enter into an event uh, that is greater than the congregation, the the preacher, the is God Himself uh, saying us something. Is it on? Oh, yeah, it is. Can I also uh, respond in a way on Father's behalf, even though he's also here to <laughs> say it? Um, in one of one of the homilies, Father is uh, speaking about how a pastor ought to relate to his sheep. And he says that the pastor needs to know, actually, I think you actually say the heart of the sheep, <laughs> but the pastor needs to be with the sheep and know their heart. And it, it has struck me that when Father um, reads the liturgy, he's reading with the heart of his sheep in mind. And then when he speaks, he speaks out of what he's heard through that very, um, that very pastoral lens. Um, all of the homilies that, that are in the, the book are ultimately practical. So they're not mere exegesis because they conclude with something that is an instruction for all of us sheep. And that instruction is, is sometimes just as simple as saying, pray for, pray for the grace of openness. Um, but there's always something practical. And it seems to me that it's that practical conclusion that is the response to the question that Father kind of approaches the readings with. So it's as though he has in mind the hearts of those to whom he'll, he'll, he'll preach. He goes before God the Father with that, that knowledge, that intention in mind. The Father speaks, and then Father speaks it. 
and it's it's never um, merely an observation. It's ultimately very practical, and I think that aligns also, Father, with who you said previously. Why why publish a book to evangelize and um, a mere abstract presentation of the gospel is not evangelization. That ultimately it is, it is the gospel only if it, um, if it in fact does move us to enter more fully into that communion between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So. The homilies often, also, they conclude with an amen, and that. Um, you can hear me, right? Is there anybody who could not hear me in this room? It's recording. Ah, uh, many of the homilies, not all of them, conclude with an amen, and that could be a kind of affectation or old-fashioned pious gesture. But every time I saw that amen, um, it it seemed absolutely right that uh, again, Father Tommaso. They're all prayers. Each of these homilies, it seems to me it's a prayer. Um, so much so that, I mean, it, it, they all exist in writing apart now from Father Zay, and he could be dead tomorrow, and they'd still be there. Uh, or we could be that. I mean, we could all be dead tomorrow. But that, that, that they, they'd exist for others to read. And then reading them, they would be doing the same thing in a certain way. They would. That's why it makes sense to buy the book. Otherwise, uh, oh, what are we going to do? I, I'm going to have the book so if I ever have an opportunity to preach, I will know what to do. That's not what they're there for. That I, I, can, I can myself read these things as prayers because they are prayers. And it's fitting that they end often with an amen. Maybe I can see Buster the sign. Is it not on Buster? Is it? Oh, okay. Would you recommend your book to youth or like your experiences to the youth? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's for you. Thank you. Hello, Father. Um, <coughs> I see that this is going to be a very good book. I'm going to Who's share that, this. Joyce? Book. Yes, I'm going to share this book with my um, seniors on spiritual reflections that I have. I it's good also book. for seniors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I also want to know when um, you're saying the homily, do you feel the Holy Spirit moving while you're on the podium um, delivering your homily? Um, what are your preparations before your homily? Uh, I have to say, um, not that often, <laughs> but I think it's more in terms of um, sometimes the the Holy Spirit gives a, a clear idea uh, about what to say, and um, sometimes it's not. Uh, it takes a while. Huh? It takes a while to understand. Uh, I try to ask the Holy Spirit to give just one idea to speak just about one thing. Uh, not more than one, because otherwise people don't remember after uh, afterwards. No, you just speak about one thing and then develop de develop the idea maybe in three points, <laughs> but uh, with a conclusion. So, uh, yeah. Uh. I just like to thank you all for sharing with us today. And I encourage all of us to um, give thanks to the Lord for sending shepherds for all of us to listen to and for us to use those words and for those to be passed along. There's someone here. Father, say thank you so much. Um, I want to tell you that we're going to read your book. Actually, my children, Diego said, I'm going to read it first. And then Ana Maria said, I already started reading it. <laughs> Great, Ana Maria. <laughs> Father, say, I have two questions. 
Um, one is, can you tell us a little bit about how you start thinking or writing the, 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 I don't know if it's the right word to say, the process or routine, if you have any, to come up with your homily? Like, do you start on Monday or do you start on Saturday or uh, whatever you can say? That one question. And the, the second question is, um, are you thinking to also maybe publish it in Spanish? Why not? Yeah, I I I, I try I try to to start on Monday to to read the the readings and to read the exegetical commentaries of the the readings to approach you to the letter of the text and then uh, try to during the week to meditate about the readings and to go from the what is more exegetical understanding of the text to more existential of myself and then what I said before about the thing about uh, the people but takes it takes uh, yeah because it needs um, time to um, to enter uh, the, the word to to make to make it yours and to to put the ideas together and sometimes on Mondays when I have an idea on, on Tuesday I don't uh, know what I'm going to say uh, then it's Thursday you have to write uh, the text because usually I send on Friday to my editor and then I have to write something and then I okay it's time to write let's do it uh, and then the idea comes when you are writing also uh, it depends but uh, it requires prayer about the text no? um, yeah I would say that first of all thank you I did not read your book, and my apology, I arrived late. Um, and I want to make sure that I understand what you're saying because I'm the chairwoman for vocations at St. Jane Francis de Chantal Church in Bethesda, Maryland. And what I understand you to say is this, that if you practice Lexio Divina, that relationship with the word, what you're in essence doing is removing those obstacles which stand in the way of the Holy Spirit working within you. And so you can get the essence. So your homily is, what is it? Uh, a good homily is how many minutes? Uh, uh, seven minutes, mine. I, <laughs> I have to say uh, the, the, the story I told John was, uh, um, I think, five, Uh, 10 and 15, so five <laughs> God, 10 men, 15 uh, the devil. So I, I preach seven minutes. The, it's between uh, God and man. So. <laughs> so the longer the homily, uh, what I understand is that the obstacles are still there and the Holy Spirit is not able to work because you're creating a, a a sacred space for the Holy Spirit to work within. Can I respond, or um, as I was reading, there are many things that I could have included, but I didn't want to go over three. Father is one of the biggest advocates, proponents of the Sacrament of Reconciliation that I've ever met. Um, and if you are concerned about removing obstacles for anything, be it writing, Um, be it, you know, your, your own vocation or anything. Um, I'll just um, echo what Father himself has said and what he himself has uh, certainly heard. Um, bring it to the sacraments. Um, no, no other method, be it Lexio Divina or, or any, you know, any kind of study, um, will be as fruitful in removing obstacles as, as Jesus Christ um, acting through, you know, the sacramental... Um, sacramental priesthood and, and the confessional, so. Hmm. We have time maybe for one or, are there any more questions? Last call? I think uh, I can, because I, I have mass at 12. You have, mass. have to sign some books. Sign, <laughs> book, signing. <laughs> book signing, that means book buying also. <laughs> so thank you, what was I saying? Thank you very much, all of you. 
Thank you. I, I'll be outside signing books if, if, uh, if you want. So, and um, then uh, at 12 noon, for those who also would like to attend the uh, Mass, there is Mass uh, um, here at the sh in the Shrine. Thank you very much.